Welcome to Stitchery Stories, where textile artists share their life in fabric and thread. Inspiration, techniques, disasters and delights. And I'm Susan Reeves, enthusiastic embroiderer and textile arts dabbler who also loves podcasting. So take a break and enjoy our light-hearted chat and please share with your friends so they can enjoy it too. Hello and welcome today to our lovely guest, Claire Hunter. Hi Claire. Hi Sue. It's lovely to speak to you to Claire, today, Claire. And Claire came rushing back off her holiday yesterday from, uh, was it Italy you've been, Claire? But we were in Italy, absolutely. Very different from a snowy Scotland that has met us this morning. A, 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 bit, a bit of a shock. <laughs> right, so I've got a bio here for Claire. Claire Hunter has been a banner maker, community textile artist and textile curator for over 20 years and established the community enterprise Needleworks in Glasgow. She was a finalist for the Aesthetica Creative Writing Award with a story published in its 2017 annual. She was also a recipient of the Creative Scotland Award in 2016. She lives near Stirling and Threads of Life is her first book. And you can find Claire at sewingmatters.co.uk. And we also have her Twitter, which is at Sewing Matters. And she's also at Sewing Matters on Instagram. Woohoo! I've, I've even done the links as well. I've remembered today. Yay, yay me. And um, on Claire's website, there's some, there's some lovely um, phrases on there, actually. And, and one that I really wanted to just pick out for you all was that Claire invites us to read about, explore and discover the social, emotional and political significance of needlework. And, and I thought that was a lovely phrase there. So thank you, Claire, for that. And thank you for fitting us in after your holiday. Not at all, Sue. It's a pleasure. Brilliant. Now then, Claire, so before we get down into the details of your stitchery story, would you like to share with us what you're working on and what's got you excited? Well, uh, what got me excited uh, in terms of writing the book was just the fact that although we've got thousands and thousands of books about sewing, very few of them ever mention why we sew, why people have done it through centuries and across cultures. Um, and so I decided that I would try and look at that question, explore it, find, gather up stories that were hidden and then put them together into a book. And so that came about Threads of Life. And that is now about to be published, which is very exciting, as you can imagine, yes. on the 7th of February. And also, amazingly, has been chosen as Radio 4's Book of the Week. And so it's going to be read by Siobhan Redmond, the Scottish actor, uh, on the 4th to 8th of February. And it'll be very interesting for me to hear somebody else read out and read back to me the words that I've written. So it's all, uh, all about to happen. The reviews are just coming out. Uh, a very kind one in the Sunday Times, another nice one in the in the mail. And so um, obviously that sense of apprehension about whether it will be liked um, is slightly modified by the start of some nice reviews, as I say. Yeah, oh, that's, that's brilliant. Yeah, so Threads of Life. Now, I was reading through the detail of the, that was in the press release, and, and my first thought was, wow. How long has it taken you to dig out all of these stories and the photographs? And it's like it must have been a, a quite an, an awesome research project um, for a start off. But I love the way that you you are dead on. It's those. It's back to the stories again, isn't it? The stories of what kind of ordinary people did and why they were sewing and what they've created. So yeah, really exciting that. Very interesting doing the research because I've always been interested in the in kind of. Uh, social uses of needlework and particularly being a banner maker then I, I've been interested in that um, so I thought I knew quite a lot Sue before I started to write but actually of course I discovered I knew very very little mm -hmm. and I researched for over three years wow. because every story would lead to another story yes. um, every website you looked up would lead to another two stories and suddenly I discovered that there was a huge amount of of, of what I call a, a hidden history, um, neglected, forgotten, of all these different kinds of people, men as well as women, sewing often in very desperate circumstances in order to make their voices heard. Yeah, I'm actually really looking forward to to seeing this because, you know, that was one of the, the, the fascinating aspects of just doing this podcast 
has been the stories that have come out from from the textile artists, different reasons why people have got into it, yeah. the effects it's had on their life, you know. And, and as I kind of laughingly say, oh, aren't I nosy? But, um, mm -hmm. you know, just, just I, I just find it fascinating. And to have been able to bring out, as you say, find these hidden stories and bringing them out for us to all to share, I think is great. And to be featured as Book of the Week and to get in some good reviews from places like the, the Times and so on, because, again, we often think, um, nobody's interested in it's just like a you know a group a group of ladies are interested in in sewing etc but i think to attract a wider audience is is a real good achievement as well well and i think that was really at the heart of what i want to do was to actually make sewing matter mm. um and as you say often those of us who do so feel that it doesn't matter to people they think of it as something that's very um private that's um that's decorative but actually, every time we're sewing something, then we're putting our feelings into it. Mm. Um, you know, both it's both emotional and tactile. Yes, yes, very much so. Right. Well, you've got a very, very exciting few weeks coming up, then, haven't you? Um, <laughs> yes. yes, I'm both excited and apprehensive, as you can imagine. Yes, so. absolutely. So, I suppose the um, book has been quite all-consuming. Then the book has been all-consuming, mm. as I say, really because. You know, you you kept thinking that actually that was the end of the research, and then you'd turn over another new strand of investigation that you just had to go down. And yeah. it still continues. I'm still finding things, saying, "Oh, that would have been lovely yeah. to put that in the book." And obviously, because you can only have so many pages and so many words, yeah. then there's lots of stories that I couldn't have in the book. I had to, you know, lose some of, it, as you say, lose some of your babies, some of the things that you really uh, loved. But, but just didn't quite fit in somewhere. Yeah. And, and so have you actually managed to do any sewing yourself recently? <laughs> I have, actually. I decided that because the book was uh, finished in, the, in autumn. Yeah. And uh, so I decided, which I've, I've done over years, is make Christmas presents for family and friends. Lovely. So I gave myself the luxury of going back to embroidery. And it was lovely to stop writing about it and to actually start doing it again. Yeah, I know what you're feeling because, as, as I've said to quite a few guests, it's um, for me, I seem to spend more time now talking about embroidery and textile art than actually doing it. So, and, uh, and one guest said to me the other day, we, You don't ever post anything that you do. I said, Well, because recently I haven't really done anything. So, but I've got three deadlines on the go for the next, um, once for next week and two for the end of next month. So, I've really got to pull my finger out and get some sewing done. <laughs> Oh, well, I was very pleased because I live in a small glen in Scotland and we have a, a tree fest at Christmas. Yeah. And so I was determined that I would manage to get an entry into that. And I, so I did a, a, a felt a partridge in a pear tree, about two foot high, yeah. with yeah. embroidered leaves and a, a beautiful sequined embroidered a partridge sitting atop it. And, and, and it was lit to have little, those little LED lights through it. Brilliant. And I did, I did win, won the individual prize. So I was very pleased I'd actually managed to, you know, accomplish something in needlework yeah. that uh, people enjoyed. Brilliant. So obviously you've been working in as community textile artist and you've seen banner and curator. So you've been been at this, you know, a, a fair few years now. How, how did you actually get started, Claire? So when I started, as most people do, you know, with my mother teaching me embroidery when... I, I was very, very young. Yeah. She wasn't actually an embroiderer herself, but I think she saw that I had a, a appetite for it, possibly. Yeah. And we had a lovely little shop in Glasgow, which was a kind of Aladdin's cave of all those, you know, beautiful anchor embroidery threads with, you know, all the colours that you didn't oh, even yes. know existed as a child. And so she used to take me in there and buy me those little stamped cheval sets and tray cloths and taught me how to do lazy daisy stitch and fern stitch and I was very very happy and then of course you know I graduated from that onto dolls clothes and yes. I probably had the best dressed dolls in Scotland <laughs> because um, again you know, my mother would, would buy little beads and you know scraps of fabric good remnant shots we had then Lovely. and you know so they would you know be dressed out in ball dresses and historical costumes and all sorts you <laughs> yeah. know. And, and from that into dressmaking you know yeah that's quite a, a, a typical path it's very similar to, so. uh, similar to mine definitely you know but my, my dolls were um punk in appearance because I, I cut all her hair off one day <laughs> <laughs> my, my doll just looked awful <laughs> but I had a lovely letter yesterday from 
uh, 11-year-old who lives in London and I met her father and three threads of life and he said that his daughter was interested in sewing and so as a surprise present because of all the textile projects I do I obviously have a kind of fantastic rag bag yes. in my in my shed and so I made her up a, a, a sewing bag which was just filled with bits of fabric and, and trimmings etc and she sent me a lovely letter saying she just started making her doll's clothes Yay. and this was just such a treat to receive this as a, as a gift through the post. Oh how how lovely. There's still doll's clothes being made you know. Yeah brilliant oh I love that I love that story and yeah and and you know what though if you're in a house that nobody sews, then you haven't got those scraps. You haven't got those scraps. You haven't got those other bits of velvet no. and those other bits, you know, etc. And because, you know, I came from a family, I've got two other sisters. So we were all involved in, in crafting things. Yeah. And um, and so there were always bits and pieces around that you could use. You know, my mother, you know, it was all hand-me-down clothes and recycled clothes to fit another child. All that went on. Yeah. So yeah. You know, we had all that as a resource, you know, when they got worn out. <laughs> So moving on from there then, would you say you've had any major inspirations for your work over the years, Claire, and, and, and possibly currently as well? Obviously, there's been a lot of inspiring stories in your book, I should imagine. A lot of inspiring stories in the book. But I think probably the main inspiration for me has been through the community textiles, because when I decided that I would set up Needleworks in Glasgow, the purpose of that was really to involve people in the community in making large wall hangings or banners which told their history or about their achievements or even about their concerns. And obviously, when you work in the community setting and people are coming in, you meet the most astonishing people with amazing talents that are unheralded. Mm. And those are really my main inspiration, those kind of unacknowledged sores who have got such imagination and such skill and given the chance to make those skills and imagination public do so with you know, extraordinary results, I feel. And so that has been and remains my main inspiration. Yeah, brilliant. That's, that's a lovely inspiration. And, and I can feel very strongly coming through from the words on your website and all of the things that you've been doing, yes, the importance of encouraging others and discovering people in the community and, and being a facilitator to help people to to move forward and to express themselves in textiles. I think the idea of the banner making, I, th- I thought was quite fascinating as well, because that, you know, when you're talking about the political significance of needlework, then, you know, a lot of banners are of a political nature, aren't they? Of a protest nature often. They are. And of course, you know, needlework, uh, you know, traditionally was a collective act people working together, sharing skills. Yes. And the thing about a banner is, again, that's making a banner, carrying a banner is a collective act. It's bringing people together to stand on the same stage and, and say that we are a group of people who care about this. And that's what I love about banners. Mm-hmm. And you have to find, you know, when you're making them, designing them, you have to find a very simple visual way of showing who you are and what it is that, you, that matters to you. Um, and, you know, within that kind of bolder statement, you can then add all sorts of smaller, more personal details. So it has that kind of the big shout and the small whisper that go together. And I and I love that contrast. Yeah, the big shout and the small whisper. Wow, that's a, that's a really brilliant way of, disgu- of, of describing a banner. That's brilliant. Now, I would just mention as well, that when I spoke with the, one of the ladies who was organising the processions event last summer, which was all about celebrating the uh, 100 years of, of women receiving the vote, then there was quite a bit of discussion in there about banners and banner making. So if anybody's interested in banner making, then that would be a, an interesting episode to go and listen to. And you were mentioned in that as well. So your, your ears might have been burning point (laughs) now then so what I was wondering about with all of this varied work do you have a specific favorite technique Claire that you might want to share with us and and why do you like it so much Uh, well the technique I use for banners and it's my favorite technique is applique yes and I suppose I love it because you can use different textures different kinds of fabrics piece them together you're you're making pictures from well from texture really and then on top of what is your basic kind of jigsaw, then that thing about the detail, then you can embroider on top and you can either 
machine a pre-k simply and then start to hand work on top of that. So I love it because it's like layered mm. with the pre-k that you're putting layer upon layer and as you're doing that you feel the work you're making is getting greater depth and greater meaning. And how do you manage the, when you're making, say, the, the banners, so they're a, a larger scale thing, is there any particular tips on managing laying out an applique design on a larger scale than, you know, maybe somebody would be doing like a cushion? You know, what are the challenges involved there? I think the challenge really is not to be scared. <laughs> I, think, I think people are scared of doing large scale. Again, uh, traditionally, you know, through the centuries, women have been encouraged to work small. Mm. You know, the, the age of the sampler, when women were restricted to that small rectangle on a frame and not encouraged to do large-scale work. And I actually, I think the, the thing to get over is, is the fear of that. Actually, it's making a cushion or making a large banner. I think when you get to a particular scale, the largest banner I've ever made was 13 foot by 13 foot. Wow. And that was... That was too big to get through a sewing machine so <laughs> and too big to even lay out in the house so I had to use the um, the village hall to to lay it out I used and I had to hand stitch quite a lot of it All right. um, just because of the scale and I couldn't actually I didn't really see the whole thing until it was finally put on public display <laughs> because I had nowhere to hang it in its entirety in my own house yeah. Um, so I, I decided after that that I actually wouldn't work on that scale ever again because that was too demanding <laughs> and um, uh, and a bit nail biting really. So my banners tend to be about four foot by six foot, that kind of size, which yeah. is a yeah. easy size to carry. And actually, you're working in small sections. You know, it's only near the very end when you're working on the on the whole thing itself. Right. Yeah. So that's what I was wondering about, the, the, just the logistics of trying to sew something really big. It's bad enough when you make curtains, isn't it? We, you know, we all grind to a halt with that. I think, oh, and my table's not big enough. I'll have to do it on the floor or whatever. So, yeah. Having the village hall is a, is, is a good one there <laughs> to get your large piece of work done. Yeah. So then I'm sure you must have plenty. Have, have you got a specific high point, uh, a couple of high points, Claire, that you could share with us from your textile art and embroidery journey so far i'm really looking forward to this well i think processions was a high point i am um, i was very lucky to be invited to be the banner advisor for the processions event which of course was thousands of women in the four main capital cities of britain coming together to celebrate and walk in the footsteps of the suffragettes and i went in the edinburgh processions and I made a banner of Mary Queen of Scots because the last time she'd walked that particular route was in disgrace after the Battle of Carberry Hill. Oh. And um, and I thought I should return her in triumph to Holyrood Palace, which is where the actual uh, procession ended. So I made one of her dancing as a celebration. And when I actually joined the procession's march, it was astonishing to see all these women carrying so many different banners so many different messages, so many different celebrations, all sorts of ages, cultures, backgrounds, women walking together, carrying aloft textiles they'd made that championed who they were and why they were proud of their sex. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, it was just an, an amazing thing to view as well. I mean, I, I, I couldn't go, but um, it was really, I would just I would have loved to have done so, but it was just so nice to see the, the images and the, the, just the positivity that came out of it all, I thought was absolutely, it was, it was awe-inspiring. It was really, really was. And uh, that you've got that kind of scale of, uh, say, thousands of women and hundreds of banners being carried. So that was a high point for me. But also... Another high point was a project I did just about a couple of years ago with a group of 10 women from Dundee, Glasgow and Edinburgh. Mm. And I invited them to make a text. So it was just a small panel uh, that actually told the story of a piece of needlework that mattered to them personally. Yeah. And there were lots of different stories that came from that. But when we did the public launch with an exhibition in Glasgow and in Edinburgh, and when we did those public launches, I invited people to bring along their own textiles and tell the story and you had all sorts of again different stories coming from that one young girl brought the pattern pieces still pinned to the fabric that her mother who sadly died had cut out for her hoping to have made her a number of dresses 
and the girl yeah. had kept the pattern pieces and was planning to make the patchwork quilt where the quilt pieces would still be in the shape of the patterns themselves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a, a woman in her 60s who brought along the tablecloth she'd sewn, learned to sew on with her grandmother who had taught her to, in, in needlework. And she'd actually become, you know, a high agent in the Embroiders Guild in the West of Scotland over her years. Yeah. And then for her to have kept that very, very, very first piece of embroidery that she ever did, that she shared with her grandmother, was very moving. So amazing stories that, that people could share of why sewing, why something embroidered or patchworked or quilted really meant something deeply emotional to them, deeply personal and connect them to other generations of women in their family. Yeah, wow. Again, a very another fascinating highlight. So that was the Material Matters yes. project, yeah. Wow, as you say, two highlights at opposite ends of the scale, but both with a very strong emotional impact as well. Yes. Back down to the emotions and the community side of things. You can have something that's huge and glorious, and then you can have something that is the simplest thing, and each have their own power. Yeah. Oh, you, you, you've got enough fodder here for about 300 books, I should imagine, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear me. Now, so going from those lovely high points, um, I'm, I'm sure you must have something to share with us. Do, do you have any stories of when something possibly didn't go quite as planned and was almost or could have been described as a bit of a disaster? So we usually have a bit of a laugh with this one. So if you've got anything to share with that or something that you've learned from that experience over the years, that would be brilliant, Claire. Oh, well, I think that, you know, I, I'm commonly having disasters too. <laughs> as bad as usually because, you know, I've, I've put the iron in the wrong setting and the, the, the silver fabric I'm using for the lettering then gets, you know, um, ironed, you know, melted onto the fabric. Onto the I think what I think is that you learn from your disasters, not that you learn to not do it again, always happens again, yeah. but you learn not to panic. You learn that actually sometimes when you make the worst mistake and you think something is totally ruined, then you think about how you can get over that and mm -hmm. you improvise a different kind of way of doing it. And that often leads to something that's much, much better than anything you planned. And I think that's my, that's my motto now is, is don't panic, take it as an opportunity and make something better out of your disaster or mistake or whatever. Yeah, no, that's that's a really good one. Don't panic. Yeah, and and that um th that that works in so many other things as well. You know, I mean, from my my computing background, when it doesn't go right, you get that heart sinking, oh, kind of feeling, and then it's too easy to start panicking. But what you need to do at that point is walk away, take a few breaths, think about what you're doing, and then go back. You know, you, you, you'll never sort it out just staring and getting crosser and crosser. And I think that's possibly the same. Of course, I'm very lucky with a plicky because yeah. a plicky you can always cover over something. <laughs> yes. You can cover over that coffee stain or that wine stain you know, with another another flower, you know. <laughs> that, that's right, actually. Some techniques, I think, are easier to recover than others. Right. Can you imagine if you were to spill some wine on some white work? Oh, I know. I know. Well, you'd have to get the bleach out, wouldn't you? I think you'd have to make it into pink work after <laughs> yes, that. That's right, pink work, yeah. I know sometimes I've thought, I've thought like a Friday night, oh, I fancy a glass of wine, I've got a glass of wine out. Right, I'm doing some wine and it's embroidery, and then I get these witty comments. Is that, is that wise? <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's always wise. <laughs> Might improve my embroidery. <laughs> Do you? And then the other thing, of course, is that you know, we quite often have some of those dreaded unfinished objects lurking around in the backs of cupboards and I know other guests have shared some that have taken on a life of their own of these things so you know, do, do you have any unfinished objects lying around anywhere Claire with a bit of a funny story and, and do you think you'll ever finish it? Oh well I have had uh, and sadly just a couple of weeks ago uh, I pulled out a, 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 it was a little linen scarf that I had started about 30 years ago so you can imagine that that you know I'd carefully uh, buttonholed stitched down the sides of it it was an old piece of very lovely linen and uh, and then I had started to embroider in in wool art deco type designs on it yeah very very in pastel colors actually very very pretty and I, you know, for the 30 years, I've kept the rules. I'm using the separate little bag. I kept the scarf in my little work box. And so I thought, you know, part of my finishing the book was also finishing a lot of the unfinished business I had in needlework. And so this runs. I pulled this out, but sadly the mice had got there before I had. Oh. 
so it was completely ruined and so I just had to throw it away. <laughs> now I don't think we've had any UFOs that have been eaten and attacked by mice and, and were therefore ruined before you could even get, oh dearie me, oh but your heart sank didn't it? Well in some ways I was relieved because it's been sitting there <laughs> guilt box for 30 years so I thought, well, actually, now you don't need to worry about that anymore. You know, that will never get done. <laughs> Move on and find something else. Absolutely. Oh, dear. Oh, that's it's sad, but it's quite funny. I know people talk about when, like, moths get things as well. Uh, yes. So there we are. We shouldn't keep things too long because something else is going to come along and eat it. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Now then, now the other thing is you've mentioned about the different projects that you've had on the go. You've had your book on the go. There was the involvement with the banners. So... I spoke recently with quite a few guests where we've been talking about, I guess you could call it a portfolio career. So there's different aspects of your work all joined together to create your life in in textile art. But I'm often interested in how you organise your creative time. So we can plan things as much as we like, can't we? But if we just say, right, today I'm going to be creative and get on with X, Y and Z you might not feel very creative. So how have you got any tips or ideas or any way that you organise your creative time that you could share with us, please, Claire? Well, I think it's, it's different for needlework and for writing. Mm. Oddly enough, with needlework, I handle my creative time very badly, I would say. <laughs> um, that's partly maybe because of the scale of, of what I'm, I make. Yes. It's sometimes daunting to go back into the shed and see that you know large piece of fabric sitting there waiting for you to embellish it with whatever you've got to do. Um, and so I always start off with peeling the fabric again, searching out threads, lots of uh, displacement activity. <laughs> this is, you know, is that the right needle? You know, or those sort of need a bit of sharpening. That all goes on. And usually I'm always there at two or three in the morning finishing off something that I could have finished off the week before. You know, <laughs> only I'd organise my time better. But oddly enough, with the writing... That wasn't the case. With the writing, I was very disciplined and often would get up at 6 in the morning and work through till 10 o'clock at night. I think that was because what I was writing was this mixture of research and actually me doing the creative writing itself. Mm. So if I was feeling not in the mood to be creative or didn't feel that I was in the right place for that, I could always then read another book about needlework. Mm-hmm. And so, and go between the two things of researching, learning, and then writing or making notes. And so it was, it was a much easier activity to organize time through than oddly enough the sewing when you've got so many different approaches, so many different things you're trying to do that mood comes into it much more than mm-hmm. it did with the writing. Yeah. You know, for me, as, as I've laughingly mentioned lots of times now, I, I seem to spend more time talking about it than, than doing it these days. I've got so I've got three three deadlines on the go. And so I have actually started three, uh, yeah, no, four actually. I've started three of the four. And um, <laughs> my son's looking at me going, well, mum, um, there's, there's embroidery everywhere now. You know, <laughs> it, it's infesting the house. It's on the kitchen table. It's in the lounge. In the, I've got this corner going now, you know, where there's very, very untidy sewing corners is on the go. And I said, so I said to him, well, never mind. I said, because your Lego is in the other spaces that the embroidery isn't. And so we've had some nice afternoons and um, evenings. He's been doing this, building this massive Lego Technics set. It's a huge one. So he's been sitting doing that and I've been sat doing my embroidery and we've been chatting. And, you know, it's been lovely. Lovely. To make some time to do that and we've yeah. sat and done it together. Different crafts, but um, that's been really, really nice. Yes, and I did that when I was making these Christmas gifts before Christmas. Then I sat in the kind of winter sun with the radio on just sitting on the sofa sewing mm. and to be doing it during the day just felt so pleasurable um, as opposed to usually for me it's the late night when I've done everything else I sit there and to, to carry on with a piece of embroidery. Yeah it must have felt quite naughty did it? Oh I'm being <laughs> naughty I'm doing some embroidery in the afternoon. That's lovely. Yeah no I, I get that this this last weekend I had various things I was supposed to be doing and I just sat there and I thought do you know what stuff it I'm not doing any of those they're all boring I'm not doing it I'm going to get out and I'm going to get this other piece started and I'm going to really crack on with it and that's what I did good for you too all day Saturday Sue did some embroidery and textile art wow (laughs) (laughs) unheard of (laughs) 
Brilliant. So that's that's really good insights there. And it's interesting you're saying about the process of actually writing a book as well. Obviously, I'm doing one with a friend of mine. It's actually about podcasting. We're taking it in turns and we've got the structure organized. And, and now I've found that an interesting process as, as well, how you can embroider really, you can't make something. I think, right, I've, I've got this chapter to write on this particular topic. And then it's thinking about how, you know, the creativity again, how to make it interesting um, and so that people will follow on and read and want to carry on with the next chapter. So, yeah, it's a, a, a different process. And, all, and also with the writing, of course, what happens and what happened with me was when you eventually get a publisher, then you have an editor. And Juliet Brooke at Scepter at Hodgins <laughs> Stoughton was my publisher. It was my editor. And uh, she was fantastic. A hard taskmaster, but somebody who then kept me interested in what I was trying to do yes you know and that was a, that was great to have somebody else who was then you know, who cared about it as much as you did and really wanted it to be the best that it could possibly be and worked me hard <laughs> to help me to get there and I really appreciate everything that she did for that oh that's brilliant that's a really good example there of the the very important role an editor places yes. on on the creation of, of a book so, and wouldn't it be nice if we had editor, editors for our needlework? That would be very nice. <laughs> <laughs> and then say, oh, no, you should actually use the slightly different shade of pink for that. You know, that bit. And have you thought about it, et And what does this bit actually, you know, uh, you, what, what technique are you thinking of using for this? You know, that'd be very nice, wouldn't it? Kind yeah. of personal editor for our own film. It would. It really would, yes. <laughs> so we've been talking about your book is in its stage of launch now and is going to be published on the 7th of February, so in the stages of that. So aside from that, that's going to keep you busy, but have you got any other plans and projects that you'd like to share with us that you've got moving into 2019 and beyond, Claire? Yes, but I've still got my banner making, so I'm still doing sewing in that professional sense. Yes. And uh, I'm just about to start one for uh, Unite the Union, and that's going to be interesting for me because it's the first one I'm doing that's actually going to be, it's an old banner that they want to replicate. Ah. So it's going to have a digitally printed background, which is the old banner. Yeah. But on top of that, I'm going to frame it in an appliqued frame and make the central what was originally a, a, a painted logo and do that in the pliqué and embroidery so it'll be the future of contemporary and traditional techniques and I think that will be very interesting to try absolutely and on the writing side then my next big project is going to be on Mary Queen of Scots and her textiles which is again another hidden history yes and I'm doing a master's in historical research at the University of Stirling really to enable me to understand how to look at old manuscripts how to do proper historical research because I want it to be authentic and I want it to be a you know, path muster yes. in the world of academic historians. I don't want to look like a fool in that world. And mm. to do that, I have to do proper, efficient uh, research. Yeah. And, um, and of course, looking at her, I mean, there's, there's vast amounts of material, but her inventories, the, all, everything that she purchased during her reign in Scotland tells us a lot about what was happening in her life and what she was thinking at that time. And then there was all the needlework that she created in captivity in England uh, over 19 years when she really made it her autobiography. Right. Sometimes used it as a political act to smuggle out messages to supporters. So a lot of that, well, some of it has been written about. There's a lot that has never been uh, thought of and never been investigated. Mm. And I'm absolutely fascinated by it. And of course, the, the film has just come out. Yeah. I actually saw it in Italian yesterday in <laughs> Bologna. And, and that was a great experience because you were just really watching the action and the, the pictures in front of you. I, I do speak a little bit of Italian, but yeah. not enough to follow a film mm. in, its, in its detail. And, um, and it, the film was wonderful. I recommend it. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Now, I also noticed one of my previous guests, Hattie, Hattie McGill. She's been doing some work on the costumes in the film and she's been sharing some oh. of the pictures on Instagram as well. So oh, if anybody wants to be interested in that, she's done quite a bit of film work. But yeah, so she's been sharing some of the work that she did on the Mary film. Well, that would be great. And it would be great to, to uh, get in contact with her and find out what what research she did as part of that. Mm. We'd link to the book very nice. Brilliant. Oh, well, there we are. So that's that's all going to be absolutely fascinating, really. So that could be another three years soon. <laughs> 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 with less sewing and more writing yes 
Well, brilliant. And I, and I love the fact that you're actually doing the your, your master's as well to help you do this. And as, that's back to the comment we made at the start, isn't it, that these books are attracting people from outside of that circle of, of just, oh, it's just needlework kind of thing um, and putting it in, a, in a, a wider context for other people to understand that it even exists and that there is a whole lot of interesting stories behind it all. It's not just a load of women messing around with fabric and thread. I, I think that giving needlework a presence mm. that it hasn't had and an understanding that it maybe it hasn't had in the past um, is, is well worth you know, using time and effort on. It absolutely is. Well, on that wonderful highlight and those are very exciting future plans, thank you so much, Claire. It's been an absolute joy speaking to you. What a load of interesting things we've talked. And again, I say this every week, we could have talked all afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Sue. It's been very enjoyable. Excellent. It's my first podcast, so you've made me more relaxed about it. Thank you for that. <laughs> oh, it's been an absolute pleasure, Claire. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Good luck with the embroidery deadline. <laughs> fingers crossed (laughs) if you like this episode and want to hear more then please join the stitchery stories fan club so you can get an email when a new episode is released it's a quick and easy way of listening and of keeping up with any news and offers from our lovely guests please visit stitcherystories.com to join the fan club of course if you have itunes then subscribe there to automatically get new episodes and why not leave us a review and rating whilst you are there So that is the end of our Stitchery story for today. So keep stitching, keep smiling and keep creating your very own Stitchery stories.